This legend of the NHL played 18 seasons, five teams, 1,178 games, seven, uh, sorry, 728 points, 320 goals, 408 assists, 140 games in the playoffs alone, U.S. Hockey Hall of Fame in 2007, Stanley Cup champ as a player at the Devils in 95, and a two-time Stanley Cup champ as coach of the Devils, First U.S. born player to jump from high school to the NHL. First U.S. born player to score 50 in the NHL. The can't miss kid, Bobby Carpenter. How are you? I'm good. Thank you very much. It's a thrill for me. Uh, I figured I'd get the uh, the fanboy stuff with the picture out of the way and set the tone <laughs> for the uh, rest of the interview. <laughs> uh, I followed your whole career. It's uh, it's exciting for me to talk to you. Um, yeah, the stats are crazy when you look at them. It's unbelievable, and the, with the way the game is now versus then, I mean, imagine with the rules today what you guys could have done. You know, I think every generation can say that, and they can always say, can you imagine the money you would make? But if you go back, uh, you go back three, four generations, uh, with the cost of living and the cost of salaries, everything's relevant. So right. any person that says, oh, can you imagine what they're making now? Well, when I was making the money I was making, it was the same thing that people used to say about me. So it, it's all the same. I just meant the, more the clutching and grabbing that, you know, you got, they don't have to deal with now like you guys did. Well, it is definitely a different game. There's absolutely no question. Um, and I still keep in touch with a lot of different people from around the the globe with, uh, with, with, with the hockey people, the players I have played with. And it's interesting how they describe the game today as it was yesterday, and, it's, and one of the one of the truest ones is from Randy Holt, who is one of the toughest players I ever played with. Yep. He called it a violent era. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's fair. I mean, you watch even going back to when the Bruins won the Cup in '11, they had to rebroadcast during the pandemic. Watching some of those games, you're like, that would have been a suspension. That would have been a suspension. Yeah. yeah. So, and that was what we're talking ten years ago. Ten years ago. Yeah. yeah. So. Um, I want to go back, though, for when you grew up, because you grew up Massachusetts kid, locally here. Um, who who got you going into the sport when you were a kid? Well, my father, obviously. Yeah. Um, everyone skated back then. Uh, uh, all my my my, uh, my my dad's friends, they all skated on the ponds and everything like that. But I think hockey, from my age, really took off with uh, with the Bruins uh, when yeah. since in, uh, when they won the Stanley Cups in seventy and seventy two. I think. Um, oh, I can't remember what the, the stats used to be. I think they were like per uh, square miles, like in around the Boston area, twenty square miles. There was like maybe. 20 ranks. And then at that point, it, it became like hundreds and hundreds yeah. of ranks. Uh, the state did a job with the MDCs and the Department of Natural Resources. Everyone had a rank. Yeah. And they're all that same uh, half igloo style. Exactly, we had one of them. Yeah. yeah, I remember when I was a kid. Uh, did you play other sports growing up? Or was it hockey the whole way? No, I did. And I, I, I believe in that I did. I played uh, – Played baseball. Uh, I wish they had lacrosse. We all would have played lacrosse if they had it, but we didn't have it. Uh, we started out with a little bit of soccer. Um, then it changed. We got a little bit of football. So yeah, we did. We, we every season we would get with the, with the kids and would play every every sport. You know, uh, we did. The um, did you have a uh, did you have a uh, a player like in hockey like a pro when you were a kid that you looked up to like admired their game. Someone older than you? Well, I think, um, you know, when I was younger, I think everybody loved Bobby York because he was the best player in the, right. in the world. But I, I think um, my 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 player that I was attracted to because I was a center was Derek Sanderson. Yep. Um, on ice stuff. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you don't want to emulate him off ice back then for sure. And actually, you became pretty good friends with Derek uh, as the years went, was, as he has gone on. And um, I, now I know why uh, I enjoyed him. He had a passion for the game. Um, he was a great player. He was a very intelligent player. And uh, the I really enjoyed balls him. for him and the sweet yeah. check. He used to do. Yeah. The sweet check. Yeah, it was great. That was a he was uh, he was larger than life for sure. Uh, yeah. So, so you're in high school. You're at St. John's, and at what point did you realize? Wait a minute, I could do this for my life. This could be my job. Uh, 
I'm assuming it was before you were on the cover of Sports Illustrated. Honestly, I think that yeah, you did. You realized it could be a job, but I don't think you. Re- I don't think you realized how long it was ever going to last because I think back then the average career was ten years. So you were actually hoping to just get ten years. Right. Um, excuse me, my eyes are watering. I got a little bit of a cold, but uh, it never. Uh, you never thought I'd play eighteen years. I mean, it was it was crazy to think of uh, of playing that long. Um, so I guess I knew early on uh, there was there was a chance. I think. The real big day was when I had made the junior national team. I think in 1980, we went to Germany to play. And uh, it was the U-20 team that you see today that plays at Christmas time. Yep. Uh, I was a 17-year-old that made the team. So I was one of the only high school players on there. And we had played Canada. Dale Howichuk was so-called uh, the best person in the draft. I think I started out being ranked like in third round or something like that. And every month it got higher and higher but i think we we had played uh, canada in the world junior championships and we had beat them seven or four i think i had four or five points and then i got put right up to the top with him so i yep. think that that tournament was when we really realized that it was going to happen pretty quick we heard about you even i mean this is obviously pre-internet but through just like word of mouth and hockey news growing up in mass you were the guy like hey there's this kid on the north shore who's gonna, you know, make it. It was, yeah, it was, you were one of the first, because back then it was a predominantly Canadian league, you know, and the Americans didn't have the foothold like they do now. No, it, there was a bunch of Americans, and I definitely wasn't the first one that broke the barrier. No, 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 no. Players that did a long time ago, but I think uh, they were players that did end up going to, to Canada to play. Robbie Fatorica's one. I mean, everyone keeps forgetting that he was one of the first ones from Massachusetts to have a, a very successful NHL career, but he, he had a different path. Mine got a lot of attention because it was high school, and we only yeah. played 14, 18 games. It was a new area where scouts had to look, um, but the hockey players were all the same. It's just where they found you. Yeah, it's, well, even when I coach, the kids I coach in lacrosse, I'm like, listen, if you're good enough, they're going to find you. You don't have to worry. Cool. You know? uh, so the the Sports Illustrated cover, for people that don't know, you were on the cover of Sports Illustrated, the can't-miss kid. Uh, how did that all come about? I'm assuming they just, you know, you get a phone call out of the blue, hey, this is Sports Illustrated? or wow. It's interesting. You got, this is an interesting story. I don't know if many people heard about this, but the, the funny thing of the ironic – Title, uh, the cat, the can't miss kid was actually plagiarism. It was actually stolen oh. from the Boston Globe. Um, so about a month, I think it was about a month before, maybe three weeks before, the Globe always ran a, uh, a Sunday profile on, on somebody, and it was kind of a, a really good article. You almost had like a whole page. I had my turn, and what ended up happening was when they were asking me what my decisions were going to be, was just after we came back from that World Championships, what would I do? if uh, I had got drafted in the first round or I had any of my choices of schools, everybody had offered me scholarships. And uh, so I was in a pretty good position at the end of the article. They had asked me what I would do. And I said, you know, I really don't know. And the, whoever wrote the article, I don't remember said, well, whatever decision you make, you can't miss. Uh, be, and that's how that started. Uh, Sports Illustrated took it to a whole level. It wasn't supposed to be that I couldn't miss the NHL. It was really, really misunderstood um, about that. But the reason why that came about so fast was, yeah, this is the really interesting part, too. The week before, I was supposed to be on the cover. I mean, I'm sorry. Let me bring back that. The week before, I was just supposed to have a couple of pages. It was always yeah. supposed to be a little bit bigger than the faces in the crowd that you used to see. But the BC basketball scandal hit, and they needed the extra pages, so they kicked me off. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty funny. The next week, nothing happened in sports. The BC scandal took all the press and everything, and the only thing that happened, I think Rusty Wallace – won a race and he had won many races before and he already so they said you know what let's go shoot this cut kid and see if we can get on the cover and, and change the direction of the magazine so it was kind of by accident <laughs> that it's it a had. great pick it's an iconic picture it it's all oh, that was shot at like five in the morning too because it had to be done by two it happened so fast yeah. i forget the deadlines that we were working with it had to be done by like 10 in the morning and we went to the twin rates at like five in the morning to shoot it <laughs> 
Yeah, it's not like now with the picture. I'm almost still asleep. <laughs> oh, yeah, jeez. <laughs> well, it's funny. The guys I, I talked to, my buddies, they're all, when I told them I was going to be interviewing you, the number of guys my age that had that cover hanging on their bedroom is just crazy. You know, of course, I got buddies probably digging through their basements right now trying to find them still, you know, just to just to be like, oh, here it is. But, yeah, it's uh, it was I, I still remember the spray. I mean, it was a great shot. You know, bad news about that. I just got inundated with pictures of it two days ago because it was if you looked on the cover, it said February 23rd. But it was 40 oh. years ago. <laughs> oh, yeah. The anniversary. I didn't like to see that. Yeah, <laughs> I didn't even think of that. So, so all right. So you get drafted, uh, third overall pick, uh, eighty-one to the Caps at the time, the highest you was born draft position. You know, you get in the league, first game, you go one and one with two pims. Twelve seconds in, I did the research on this. Twelve seconds in, your assist is still NHL record for a fastest point score to start a career. You know, I had a really, really great team uh, oh, yeah. and, and to, of people to go. We, we weren't very good hockey-wise during the year. There was a lot of changes. But the, we had an older team, and they really respected me. They really helped me. Uh, they nurtured me, and it was an awesome team. If I'd have went, if I'd have got drafted, let's say, by the end of the Oilers, I probably would have went to college to play for a couple of years because oh, yeah. I was so skilled and everything. The team that drafted me was was perfect. Uh, Max McNabb was the one that drafted me, and he, he actually did a great job when I came in. We had Gary Green as a coach, but we had a really old team, and we had the only the two really good younger players we had. Actually, we had three. Uh, ben Gustafson was one. We had Mike Gardner. We had Ryan Walter. <laughs> But there was a lot of all the players, and um, they were great to me. We had Alan Hankslater. We had the Hound Kelly. We had Aris Kinderchuk. Um, so they were really good to me, and they, and they enabled me to play. They protected me. So uh, that first shift, I mean, I felt so comfortable coming out of training camp with them because they treated me so well. Yeah, it's it, – you know, looking at some of the guys you played with over the years, I mean – it's like legends. At some point, you must have been like, all right, so you go to the 85 All-Star game after you lit it up with that that year, the year you had 53 goals. At what point in the first three, four years were you like, you're like, holy shit moment, I'm in the NHL, you know? I you mean, you never did that. And, you know, no, you, it's just you, gradual. You, you never did that to you. You know, you, you know. It's really interesting. You never really realize what you accomplished till years and years and years later when you start to see, when you retire and you start to see these kids that play hockey that are trying to get scholarships and how hot it was, you didn't right. realize how lucky you were. Right. How skilled you were and how easy it was for you. It's, a, it's, it's almost impossible to get a scholarship, let alone go – to play at a higher level. So I was, you never realize that till you got to understand what other people are going through. Yeah. Well, it makes sense. I, you know, I mean, for me looking at it from the outside, you know, you go yeah. in there and you're like, Holy smokes, that's Rod Langway tying, tying his skates up right there. I'd be like, oh. but you know, yeah, it's all when, we used when to. You get thrown into that locker room and everyone's at the same level. You expect yeah. everybody to be the same until you get out of it. And then until you yeah. see other people and you don't understand it. So, all right, so in D.C., you're there for the first – you were there for your first five years, right? Yeah. Five years of your career? Yeah. And then – so and then the the year that you – you had a, a, a odd year that when you got traded. You had a brief stint in New York. Right. And then L.A. And it just seems like that's a tough go. You were only, what, five years in, so you're like, what, 22, 23? Somewhere around there, yeah. Uh, it was uh, it was a uh, you know so there, had, there was some issues with um, with Washington. Uh, we had a coach Brian Murray that um, I mean he was a very good coach. Uh, we didn't see eye to eye. I think I think you know as getting older and again we talk about how the league has changed. Yep. Even if you were 18 years old, back then they treated like you were 30. You were supposed to be a mature and adult and experienced person, and you're still 18. And I get into player development now, and, and I was trying to explain to some of these teams, listen, he's only 19, he's only 20, he's got a long way to go. We can't be pushed this. Back then, it was expected for you to do it right away. And they didn't realize that you were immature, you were young, inexperienced, arrogant. Got cocky. money in your pocket. Yeah, I mean they didn't they didn't understand it. They just thought you were supposed to just go play. 
and they didn't we didn't have player development people to work with people like me so it was really hard in washington it didn't work out well uh so we moved and went to uh to new york and that was when phil esposito was trying to break the nhl record for the most trades in one year and i just happened to slip into yeah. that i was gonna ask if because <laughs> you couldn't tell who was who was over uh, it, they, you know that year was just so convoluted and looking back through timelines and i was, was wondering if this was you know was the guy yeah oh yeah, yeah. he, he yeah. traded everybody i mean he even traded trainers and yeah. equipment people we traded he traded you for marcel dion so that's, that's we had, pretty- yeah we had it we had tommy laidlaw and myself went to went yeah. to la for for um for, for marcel um which was, good. Yeah, it was really, yeah. it was really yeah. good to say that. Absolutely. Yeah. My, I, I, Marcel was an incredible player. Oh, yeah. Uh, so yeah. when you're in L.A., you walk in, you talk about a veteran presence. You got Gretzky there. No, no. Oh, I thought, was, he, I thought you overlapped with him. I did, but my, Gretz was not there oh, my first two years. The second year. Second year. Yeah. Very okay. good. Actually, oh, third. Okay. So uh, we had a vet, we did not have a very good team in LA, and we were last place, uh, and we had the worst schedule, the worst travel of any team possible. So there was no Anaheim, there was no Colorado, there was no Dallas, there was no, uh, no San Jose. So our closest road game was a two and a half hour flight to Vancouver. Now, not only did you go to Vancouver, our division, who you played eight times, was Winnipeg, Edmonton, Calgary, and Vancouver. So we had to go to Customs every single game, and it was really, really difficult place to play. Was this still was this was this charter flights then, or was no, that no? No, we didn't. Actually, it's interesting how charter flights come about. We can talk about that a little yeah, later. Yeah, sure. Uh, and it's actually a Boston Bruins story about how Harry Sinden was so called being so cheap. But we'll we'll talk about that down the road. So no, we didn't have any charters. It was all commercial back then. So we did not do very well. Uh, I think it for a while now. Jerry Buss was thinking about getting rid of the the, the Kings. Uh, I think he wanted to focus more on the late because of how good that they were. And uh, in comes Bruce McNall, who wants to change the whole thing around and make trades and get rid of people and do this. And obviously he did a great job because he put together a heck of a team. Uh, so my that summer of my my um, third year is when Gretz had come. And it was, okay. um, you know, he shows up to training camp. He's my roommate. And oh. We started to play on the same line together, but it didn't work. Uh, I was a little bit different player than he than he expected to be. He was, uh, I was a little bit more responsible defensive player. So rather than be as much offense as he wanted, I wasn't in the same zone as him as most of the time. It's, it's easy to say that way. So we didn't really click well together. I was more of a defensive player at that time, or you know, an all around player. It'd be like asking Gretz to be playing with Brian Trotche or somebody like that. It probably wouldn't work, but if he had played with like Mike Bosby, it would have worked great. So it was different types of players, but that wasn't a personal thing. But Gretz was uh, one of the best roommates I had, obviously next to Scotty Stevens I had for 12 years. Uh, but what a great man he is, incredible person. You know, speaking of LA, there's one guy I do want to ask you about. Well, two, actually. One, Bernie Nichols, because – you got a lot of comparisons to your game and his being similar when you were coming up. Right. Bernie Nichols and I were really, really close friends uh, yeah. when we were in L.A. Um, Underrated, great player, doesn't get the acclaim that, you know, he's probably, you know, should have. He's got seven goals. I mean, and I yeah. watched it. I was there that year. It was incredible. Everything he shot went in the net. Yeah. He was such a smart player. Uh, wasn't a very good skater at all. Didn't have a great shot, but he was extremely an intelligent player. Yeah, that looks like can be the difference. The other guy I wanted to ask you about, because this, when I was reading, like looking at the rosters, you played with Tiger Williams? No. Oh, yes, I did. And he, All right, so for anyone at home who doesn't know, Tiger Williams, Dave Tiger Williams retired with just shy of 4,000 penalty minutes for mm-hmm. a career which is mind-boggling because they weren't giving out 10s like they do now no. for yelling at the refs. You, He earned those minutes. And he was not a big guy at all. Again, I go back to, like, the, it was, a, again, it was a different sport back then. So, for instance, I'll give you an example. I, it, this is how much it's changed about strength, conditioning, bodybuilding. 
So Tiger Williams was not a very big guy. Um, and Randy Holt was not a very big guy. I mean, those guys were probably 5'11", 175 pounds. But they were as tough as nails. Right. But, you know, you could fight any one of those guys, and they – would cut you, you'd bleed, you'd lose some teeth, but it, they wouldn't hurt you. Uh, very rarely did you ever get hurt in a fight. So to fight those guys, yeah, you didn't want to, but they weren't, like I said, they, they were very good, strong fighters that fought everybody that did. Fast forward a few years, I have to say the first guy that I knew years to come after that was like Joey Kosher. He was a guy that people actually became afraid of because he could hurt you. I mean, he could break bones. His hands were massive. And then became that whole new level of tough guy and separated everybody. And you never was afraid to fight my first few years because you might lose the fight, but you didn't get hurt. And then came the time when you could get hurt and it changed. Well, everything. there was one, I saw one clip where you you took on the Sutter brothers, not you by yeah. yourself. But it was, uh, I was like, lying. holy smokes, they're, I mean, they're legendary with their sound. Yeah. But like yeah. I said, you weren't afraid to fight then. And then, but then like Tony Twist came and you had Stu Grimson and Mike Peluso. I mean, I could go on. Those were the first generations of guys that, hey, I'm not going near this. It <laughs> was, want, uh, it's I, funny. I don't I my jaw broken or my elbow <laughs> broken. I just want to play. <laughs> there was one clip I saw where you scored a goal against Detroit and Probert. Like you know, He's another one. Yeah, five six seconds after your goal comes across and elbows you. Yeah, and it was okay. He could do it. <laughs> yeah, well, the the best was the the whole Washington bench is all like, uh, so who wants exactly. to? Yeah, uh, yeah. So I, yeah, I mean, those guys was a whole different deal for it sure. It Was yeah, yeah. But like Ty said, he was only. I mean, the other actually, Chris Nyland was a very very great fighter. He, I mean, he. I think he's second to to him, isn't he? I don't know. I just saw Tiger Williams, and my my eyes lit up. I, I, yeah, think, no, it, I, I think Chris Nyland's sure. Yeah, I I uh, so all right. So we're in LA. You get traded to Boston. Yeah. Homecoming for you. Yeah, I assume Bruins fan growing up, or oh yeah, for sure, yeah. absolutely. Um, yeah. it didn't go great. Um, it was really terrible at the beginning of of when I first got traded because. I got hurt in L.A. I, at Christmas. We had played the Russian team, and I had crashed in the net. I had broke my navicula in my, my wrist, and that's a minimum of like six to eight months in a cast. So I come, and I'm not even cleared to play. So I'm sitting in the stands for the first month. And I can't play. So it's real. And I got traded for the two most popular players, yeah. Yeah. Steve Casper and, and Jay Miller. So, no, it did not go very well my first my first few months. I don't I, even remember that injury. I don't even remember that. Yeah. No. Uh, so it was some animosity. The coaches' staff had a tough time, and it wasn't good. And I did. I never got the cast off till July. So I played whatever I played with a cast on, and people were like, oh, what happened to this trade and that thing and everything. So it didn't go well. And then – I remember I was really disappointed and I was really upset. And um, and then uh, I got a call. Uh, Terry O'Reilly retired uh, yep. from coaching. And then Mike Milbury came and he gave me a call. And I met him somewhere in Portsmouth. I think at that Howard Johnson's. Uh, oh, at the Rotary there. Yeah, at yeah. The Rotary. yeah. And he explained to me what he thought my role was going to be and how he's going to use me. And I came across, away from that, really excited to play. That was a Mike did a great job of putting confidence back in me and and, and uh, gave me a role, told me what I had to do. So then I was excited. I was excited again. It, it worked out well, and uh, we went to the finals one year. We lost in the semifinals twice a year. So playing in Boston for those four years was really, really, really good. It was the first time we ever got. We've been in the playoffs in Washington before, but it was a really the first time we had a chance for the Stanley Cup. Yeah, that was the um, the finals was the triple overtime, right? Yes. Yep. The first yep. game. Glenn Wesley missed the empty. West missed the open net. I wasn't going to bring it up, but yeah. <laughs> I was laying on the ice. It was interesting. I was I was on the ice. I kind of went to the net and I kind of had fallen, and I saw West have it. So I kind of turned my head and put it on the ice because I didn't want to get hit. And then I'm like, "Where's the crowd? What yeah. happened?" <laughs> so I never really saw it. 
Well, you didn't. Yeah, uh, you didn't miss anything because I remember watching that over and over. <laughs> so no, that well, you also. So when you were here uh, in Boston, with that was also um, on one of on, under Rick Bonus your last year, right? He came. Uh, so I had Mike for two, or three, two. two. Uh, Two. two, yeah, I think two, and then bonus two. was the year the last that you guys year. swept right. Montreal though for the first yeah. time ever. Yes, yes, yeah. We I was actually at the game, the deciding game as a kid, you know, and that was when they patted you down going in, and the cops did, you know, and we right. all had cut off brooms stuffed it down our pants. <laughs> the cop patted me down, and he goes, "What's this?" I'm like, uh, "It's a broom." He goes, "Don't pull it out because you'll jinx them. Have a good time." I was like, all right. <laughs> Boston cop was like, yeah, give it a throw, man. That's yeah, that was uh, – I remember that team very well. That was a, a great team. Now, one thing I, I do want to ask you about, uh, the injury, the knee injury. So up in Montreal, uh, which a lot of people I'm sure remember, you it was behind the net, right, where you went – Yeah, I was killing right? penalty. I was killing penalty, and uh... – uh, I forget. I think, I'm not sure who had the puck from Montreal, but I thought I had a chance to get him for, uh, before he went behind the net, which today is not a smart play. Uh, you're supposed to stop and meet him on the other yeah. side. So actually, uh, it, it would be a kind of a dumb play that I kind of hurt myself. But the Montreal ice wasn't good at the time. Uh, they had the firm boards because they never moved them in and out like the garden did. And when I fell, I hit the baseboard, and it just shattered. It just you knew right away. I knew it was bad. I didn't know the extent of it till we got back home. Um, mm -hmm. But then, you know, I had an incredible team of doctors. Dr. Bert Zarens was unbelievable. Doctor Boyle was insisted he was he was incredible, and it was a Doctor Jupiter. There was actually three of them. So they technically kind of took the knee cap out and put it on a, a table, and they, they kind of put it together like a jigsaw puzzle, which was like, I think it was 14 places or something like that. And that's when you, I remember the, I still can remember in my mind's eye, the videos of you on that that motion machine laying on a couch. Yeah, it was a CPM machine, a current passive motion. And what it did was when you put the kneecap together in a jigsaw puzzle, it's not smooth. And if you have that under your knee to your knee, it's painful. So what they did was I just moved up and down for six weeks to smooth it out as it healed. And it worked unbelievable. I mean, like I've run three marathons since then. I played. They, they didn't expect me to play hardly any more after that. I ended up playing nine. I remember having yeah. a bet with Mike Milbury. We were talking after it happened. And he was like, "So you know, you had a good career and everything." I'm like, "What are you talking about?" I said, "I'm going to play ten more years." And he laughed. He's like, "Yeah, right." I only yeah. played, I played nine, so I was close. <laughs> that was the midway point, pretty much. Yeah, it was. It yeah. was. It was the total turning point of becoming a scorer defensive player and actually mike was a mike was a part of the uh the, the, the defensive part because um when we had played edmonton in the finals we had we had a good team we had a very good team we had uh, you know craig janney who had a lot of points cam neely i mean we had a, a very offensive team but we didn't have anybody that could play against mark messier who was a a moose. Well, that's why they called him moose. Yeah, right. So Mike said, listen, I don't care what you do. You're not on the power play. You can kill some penalties, but we just have to make sure we don't let Messier control it. And, I mean, not to toot my own horn, but he didn't uh, – I don't think he got a point in that series. It was the uh, – Jelenay, the uh, the kid line, they call it. Jelenay, Graves, and uh, – um, yeah. Adam Graves, Martin Jelena, and uh, who was the other one from Edmonton? He was, uh, and uh, they lit it up. They, 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 they it was they were a deep roster at that time. Murphy, so. Joe Murphy was the other player, and they had a deep roster. They were the third or fourth line, and they were incredible. And Ranford stood on his head. So, uh, but it was yeah, uh, they were a better team. Uh, we were hoping to win. Uh, they beat us in five. Oh yeah, the Ari Curry. I mean, they they had some. Oh, they, yeah. they were out to prove that they could win without Gretzky too. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a big motivator for yeah, sure. Yeah, no big yeah. deal. I'll handle Messier. You guys get everybody else. <laughs> Not a big task at all. <laughs> so, oh, you know what? I did want to ask um, uh, regarding your knee. Have you ever have you had any conversations with uh, Kevin Miller? the current Bruin who uh, has broken his kneecap? No. no I'm just curious. No. That was just a curious thing. No, yeah. it was, uh, you know, it, it's, it, yeah, it's it's not a fun thing to go through. It's, it's a long process. Um, yeah. 
it's a long process because they got to screw it together. And then after the eight to 10 weeks, they have to remove the screws, but then you have to wait another two months for all those holes to fill in. So it's, you know, it just takes a long time. Yeah. It's not quick by any means. No, it's not. So, I mean, overall, so you, you leave Boston and then it's uh, a year back in Washington before you head to the devils. When you went back to Washington though, uh, if I have this right, uh, Terry Murray was the coach, right? He was. Yes. Now he was, yeah. didn't you play with him also? I did. My first okay. year. Yeah. He was on the team my first year. So that must have been a, a odd diet, you know, like, hey, I remember when you never covered your guy on the back check and now you want me. You know what I mean? Is that that? It's like an odd dynamic. It just shows to your longevity. Well, that was an interesting. That was interesting. So I, I, I became a free agent and um, we had talked to Washington and so they had had a struggle uh the last couple of years they had a couple of years, a couple of times where they i think maybe twice i know once for sure they were up three games to nothing and they lost so they were taking a lot of heat down there so i think my signing for washington wasn't really to help the hockey club because they i had just come off the bad knee i think it was more of a political thing so yeah. When I got there, I'm like, I find myself on the third or fourth line and not playing. I'm like, what is going on with this? So that was short-lived. Uh, yeah, no, I know. Well, you settled into a sweet spot. New Jersey, I mean, that's where you won the cup. Yeah. You know, I mean, you 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 were a, a hell of a player for, for New Jersey. And the guys, I mean, now you come you come back. And Scott Stevens, who you remember from your first go-round in Washington, yeah. he's now – the Scott Stevens everybody knows, right. the captain with the big open ice hits. I mean, you fit in perfectly for that team that won the cup. I mean, Scotty and I always stayed close friends. Um, our wives always stayed close friends. We uh, were at each other's weddings and everything. So we always kept in touch about what was going on. So when this opportunity became a free agent, I spent a lot of time talking to him about what was going on. Of course, Lou was the one in charge and he yeah. was the one that was great. But, I think uh, the whole thing, we had a very good team. Uh, we, in, it all came together when they got Jock Lemaire. I mean, he was yeah. he was the best. Well, his resume sp as a player speaks for itself. And then, yeah. yeah. And He's the, the one that brought it all together for us. That team, though, I mean, looking at some of the guys, I mean, that was Niedermeyer, you know. I well, mean, our defense was incredible. I mean, it's we just, had Bruce Driver, Nita Myers, Stevens. Uh, we had uh, Dale Chambers. Uh, we had um, – who else did we have on defense? There was Al, uh, Tommy Abilene. Uh, uh, we had Marty Brochure. Marty. And it's interesting, too, because uh, most people don't know because, again, the press is funny. Uh, yep. even in, in the, in, as we see today – the press can make you believe what they want to believe. And we all had to laugh in New Jersey when they kept saying we played a boring game, we played a trap. Well, yes, we had when we didn't have the puck, we played defense, and we had the least amount of goals in the NHL, but no, they didn't talk about us leading. We led the league with 220 goals one year. Yeah. And they kept well, saying we're blowing it out of trap. I'm like, that's that's a the story. That doesn't yeah, go with the narrative. Yeah, that doesn't work. But that's what, they, that's what they wanted because they didn't want us to win. They wanted the Rangers and they wanted L.A. They wanted Detroit. You know, they wanted all those teams. They didn't want the, the big boys. markets, the original six. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. yeah. The um, – uh, when one guy to bounce back, sorry about the Bruins. One guy I did want to ask you about. I mean, obviously you played with the legends. Someone who I always liked his game, and I just think of what he could play like now. Do you remember uh, playing with Greg Hoggard? Hoggard, uh, yeah. You know, yeah. I guess he was. You know, of course we do. And 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 every place he went to, all he did was produce and get yeah. points. And after two years, he wasn't good enough, and he'd go to somewhere else yeah. and he'd be better. And he'd go yeah. somewhere else and he'd be better. It was unbelievable what he accomplished for such a small guy. I mean, he I shouldn't say small guy. He was short, but he was yeah. pretty stocky. But, oh, my God, could he run a power play? Could he yeah. see the ice? And everywhere he's we ran, cool. he proved everybody wrong. <laughs> yeah, I just – he's one of those guys that I've always like, oh, man, if he was playing yeah. now. Oh, it would imagine that. Yeah, it'd be unbelievable. Yeah. Absolutely unbelievable. Um. All right, so you finish up your time in New Jersey. Oh, one guy I did want to ask. So you playing with the Bruins and then playing with the Devils, you played with Neely on the Bruins and you played with Claude Lemieux 
on the Devils. So you've seen both sides of their, we'll call it friendship. Yeah. <laughs> so any insight on that <laughs> from both views? Well, it's really, it's really interesting. Cam is actually really mild mannered. It, it yeah. takes a lot, a lot to get him going. And Claude Lemieux knew how much it was going to take to do it, and he was persistent. And he knew there was a breaking point with Cam. And it took him games before Cam finally got mad, and he did. Oh, <laughs> but yeah. Cam, you know, Cam is actually a really mild guy, you know, but you don't think that when he when he when he loses it, he loses it. That's what everyone sees. But it takes a lot, he's got a long fuse. Uh, I don't know if I'd be it it and he was going to be patient with it. <laughs> it's funny is if you look at the Bruins now, outside of Cassidy, the head coach, uh, the president, Neely, the GMs, Don Sweeney, oh, the assistants, Kevin Dean, and yeah. Jay Pandolfo, you played with all of them. I did. Yeah. yeah you played with the, you almost had the full sweep if you ever I played did, with Butch, yeah. you would have had it. I know. You know? It's, it's, just a, it's just a funny little odd thing I found when I was looking up stuff. I know. Isn't that something? <laughs> it's, it's, it shows your longevity again. Exactly. Um, so exactly. you finish up playing, and then it's right into Albany, right? I mean, yes. what was what was the, uh, the, the lap, the laps between playing and coaching? It seems on the hockey DB, super tight. Well, I had played 18 years. Lou said there was not a spot there for me. He said I could go and try and become a free agent early and talk to other teams. Again, a lot of teams wanted a one-year deal. Um, I had We had children at the time, my wife and I. Um, I wanted two. Uh, the closest one we came to is Tampa. Um, they wouldn't really budge on the, the second one. They gave an option and stuff, and I'm like – and I wasn't going to play without my family because they were young. And I'm like, I don't really want to go there for a year with my family and have to move again. And that's so, when Espo was running them too, right? Yes, he was. Yep. Yeah. And it just, and then all of a sudden we got to a point um, where we had to make a decision. Um, and Lou had said, listen, I need a weekend and we need to call on Monday because we have to fill the spot. And I spoke with my wife and, we just figured it was the right thing to do at the time. Um, we don't have any reasons or facts or anything. It was just more of a feeling, I guess. Had, had you always wanted to get into coaching? No, or was that not at all. I mean, not, not I don't. Well, I shouldn't say that. I had a real good relationship with, with Lemaire, and we used to talk all the time about the different philosophies and why he did things. So I think when I got to New Jersey, I had some thoughts of it. Not, I didn't really say, I'm going to be a coach when I'm done. Right. Uh, I didn't know what I wanted to do. And then Lou kind of just says, listen, he, and, and when, I went to, when I went to Albany the first year, it was great because Red Gendron was the assistant coach. He actually was with us in New Jersey when we won. He was the uh, University of Maine that had won the NCAAs. And um, John Cunoff, who I knew forever. So I had great company to go there. So my, my first year coach, I actually just sat there and watched. Yeah, um, and it was great to be able to to have uh, to be uh, tutored by those two guys. They were phenomenal. They told me what I should look for, what I should do, how I should act. And I remember my first game uh, sitting behind the bench, and after the game we came in, so we had to write a report about different players on how they did and everything. And I remember staring at it, and Red and John are like, "You're gonna fill that out?" I'm like, "I don't know how." They said, "What do you mean?" I'm saying. Like, I didn't even know these two guys played. I mean, like, it was totally a different way to watch the game, and it took a long time to become a, to watch it as a coach, as a player. <laughs> well, you got your name on the cup two more times as a coach, though. It was unbelievable. I mean, so that year, the, that actually was that same year, uh, the Devils were struggling for a little bit. They made a change, and I had a good relationship with Larry Robinson because he was with Jock also. He came with yep. Jock Lemaire. And – he requested that, that I would come up and, and work with him when, when he got the, the head job. So it was only like the end of the, you know, maybe like maybe I think eight games or 10 games left. So I went with him and we ended up winning, which was incredible. Uh, Larry did an absolute phenomenal job. So then they wanted me to move back to New Jersey. And I'm like, no, I'm like, I can't, I don't want to. I said, I can't move back. I said, I, this is the reason why I didn't go to Tampa. So we didn't move around. And we had a great place in Albany. We loved the people, the kids had settled in there. So 
I didn't stay with Larry. I went back with uh, with Albany, which I don't know. I think today maybe I regret that a little bit because I think I let Larry down. I mean, he was depending on me, and I, I feel bad that I that I kind of like left him. Uh, but so the next year we go back again at the playoffs. So now they they make the playoffs again. We're we don't make the playoffs in Albany, and. I go down to work with the extra players and things, one thing's led to another. And Larry's like, you know, listen, I got to get you back behind the bench again. So I'm like, okay, so we do. And that's the year we lost to Colorado. That's the year Ray won. Yep. Uh, so we lost to Colorado and Larry says, you got to stay. You got to stay. I'm like, no, I can't. So I go back again. Then Larry gets replaced with uh, the Pittsburgh coach. I forget his name. Um, I think I might. Constantine. Okay. Yeah, and yeah. I don't have much of a relationship with him. He does things on his own. It doesn't go well. They lose the first round of Carolina. He gets replaced with Pat Burns, who I didn't know, but I knew him from Boston. He lived up at Lake Winnipesaukee. And so we had, I don't even know if we even had met. And Lou had got us together and Pat had asked me if I wanted to come down and Lou had said, listen, you can't keep saying no. You have to come down or I'm not going to give you any more contracts. So I'm like, Jude, we got to go down to New Jersey because I'm not going to get paid. <laughs> yeah, Pat, that was the one. We won that year with Pat, too, which was unbelievable. Which is guys still on the team that you played with as well. Oh, yeah, for sure. Yeah. There's lots of them. Yeah. yeah. That's, that team, not so much. That was a lot of different. The first year with Larry, oh, I was almost everybody. Uh, but yeah. that year was three years down the road because it was 2000 with Larry and um, it was 2003. So there was kind of a big changeover. I think there was only like maybe, well, there's only, I think, in the, as players and coaches. Uh, was Brodeur oh, and Stevens, right? Niedermeyer, Danico. Niedermeyer, um, yeah. Oh, yeah, Danico retired after that, won the cup and skated yeah. off. Yep. Um, there was, uh, I think there was only like seven of us that had won all three or eight of us coaches slash players. Yeah. Yeah. So I think there was four players and obviously uh, Jacques Caron, the goalie coach. Uh, I think Larry, I don't know if Larry was, no, Larry was not with Pat. So I think there was only like three. Oh, okay. Yeah. I thought it was more. I, I had a lot of screens open. Looking. Yeah. I'm not sure. There wasn't many though. Maybe there was nine total players slash slash staff and then you find yourself in the khl huh yeah that was interesting that was fun now with the timelines of your daughter who's i mean we'll, we we could talk about her i mean uh, talk about an accomplished player but she was were you there first and she went or was she there first and you went uh i was there first uh, okay. there was always plans for her to come and it was supposed to be after the Olympic team, but that didn't work out for certain reasons uh, that we're still trying to figure out today. Yeah. So when she got done with that, uh, she needed a place to play because it was no women's hockey because it was kind of slash postponed for the Olympics. So um, we always thought that she would go over there at one point. So it was, and they had drafted her. So it was, it was, you know, we, she was going to go. We just didn't know what time or what date. So she needed to get away. Um, she needed to forget what happened. And she needed to uh, get going on. And it was absolutely a perfect place for her. I mean, she's on the other side of the world. But the best thing is they were in the Canadian League. So they kept coming back home. It wasn't like she was in China for the last five months. They would come back here and they would be stationed out of Marlboro. And they would play you know, like Montreal, they would play Toronto and then they'd take a trip out and play Calgary. But then when they went back to China, they were there for like six, eight weeks and Toronto would go over for three games. Montreal would go over for three gotcha. games. So that's, it was a perfect, perfect situation for her. And then you, I, I listen, based on your person, what I know of your personality, I don't know your coaching style, but I'm guessing for the players, you were a bit of breath of fresh air after taking over for Keenan in the KHL. Based well, on his, uh, I mean, Mike did a great job. Mike, I actually, you know, it's interesting. I, 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 I it's it, this. I always, Mike and I used to always laugh at this because I, I really loved Mike. I'm like, I had a great relationship with him. Actually, I just texted him the other day, and we still text all the time. I think Mike is great. But I said, Mike, if I was 25 years and played for you, I'd have killed you. <laughs> <Right>? So <laughs> we do. He goes, yeah. He says, I would have yelled at you too. And I said, I know we would have never been able to play for each other, but to coach for each other. 
It was awesome. And we had a, a third one, uh, Igor Kravchuk, who had a lengthy career. He was phenomenal, too. We had a great, great coaching staff. So when Mike left, it was kind of sad for us. You know, me and Igor were like, you know, this was going really well. And I wasn't there to take over to make the playoffs or anything. It was just to get through the rest of the year. So, I mean, then the players, uh, Mike was hard. Mike was firm. And there was those players didn't make the NHL for a reason. Uh, and I think when Mike was firm with them, they, they was the, you know, the reasons why they didn't play in, in the NHL. Uh, there was, whenever we say why you're playing in the NHL, there's always a reason. Why are you in the American League for 10 years? Well, there's a reason. Uh, there's a reason why they were where they are at. They were all great guys. They worked, they competed, but they're missing some things. Because if they had those things, they'd be playing in the NHL. And I think Mike was a little hard with that uh at times uh, but we had a great relationship i think mike's the best uh, i got i was so happy to have a chance to get to know him the uh the stories coming out of the khl like you hear like on some of the other podcasts and such are crazy absolutely crazy the russian gas and all this stuff now you guys were based in china did you see any like the the owners take with bringing in like with money for performances after the games and stuff like that you ever see anything like that when you um, were over? no we didn't see anything like that but the, the thing with that league is uh it is a business league so for instance i'll give you an example i don't think any team makes money i think that the only one that would make money is like st petersburg who has uh uh, a phenomenal rank. They get a lot of people. Um, the other teams might make some money, but the salaries are pretty good. But what, what it is is it, uh, it it it's a um, it's a business league. It's all about gas and oil and pipelines. And everybody that owns a team, they own a team because they like hockey. They're big fans of hockey, and that's basically what the league is. So when this this guy by the name of Billy Nyog, who was our owner in, in Beijing, he was making some a lot of business deals with gas and oil uh, with the um, Roethlisberger's in St. Petersburg. So they're like, hey, why don't you have a hockey team? Yeah, good idea. So he has a hockey team. So it became a hobby uh, and it became a passion for him. So that's what that league is really about, and um, which makes it fun, you know? Yeah. I've seen like there's a documentary floating around with the bears on the ice and all kinds well, of it's stuff. A show. I mean, it's a complete show. I mean, it's unbelievable. Uh, from the cheerleaders to the bands to the drums. I mean, it's, it's well, it's like Las Vegas now, right? It the, is. The, it's, it, ice, is yeah. it is. Yeah. It is. It was. It was a. It was a whole new eye opener for me. But <laughs> the 16 hour flights from um, from from Shanghai to Lenin, uh, St. Petersburg or Jokerit, Finland. I mean, it got to be a lot of trouble. I think we kept, I kept track of the time. So the one year that we were there, we spent a total of eight days on the plane. Oh my God. I can't even imagine. But Billy, our, our owner, Billy Nyog, he was an incredible owner. I mean, we had more food, more comfort than we could possibly make. He made it easy for us to travel. Uh, all right, so you're in you're in Russia. You you you, uh, you come back. Uh, we touched on your daughter briefly. Yeah, um, yeah. I just want to talk about her and your sons a little bit. So she, your daughter Alex, played at BC. She was uh, led women college scoring for two years in a row. She won the the uh, Patty Kaismeyer Award, Olympic silver medal. She's she's still currently playing right in she in is. China. No. Yeah. I got five minutes before this game starts. If we want to do this another time, you want to pick it up for and finish it another time? Yeah, that's fine. If you, we can set up another time. I, I just wanted to talk right. about your kids and then see if I could get any stories about the Bruins out of you. Sure. You know, if it's all right with you, we can set up another time. Sure. Uh, there's no problem. I'd love to finish it because you had a great timeline. Everything seemed to go in, in order, but uh, my research. That, that half hour <laughs> turned into an hour. <laughs> yeah, I was watching the clock, and I was like, oh, shit. All right, so why don't we do this? We'll, we'll hold it here. I'll let him know we're going to add on to it. All right. We're back with Bobby Carpenter, picking up where we left off. You can see I'm still in the kitchen with my <laughs> stinky jerseys hanging over the microwave. Uh, one thing, because the jersey stinks because we didn't lose our last game, so I didn't wash it. Do you? <laughs> did you have any superstitions when you were a player? No, I had zero. Uh, None? Think, no, no. I think hockey players have routines. Um 
But the difference between a superstition and a routine is that if you have a routine and something goes wrong, it doesn't matter. You just right. fix it. A superstition, you panic. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Well, there were a few people that had them, but I didn't know many. Okay. I'm just curious. Uh, yeah. I get made fun of by some of the guys I play with. Uh, I just want to bounce around for a couple of things we missed. Um, one was the draft. When in 81 was the, by my research, was the second year it was open to the public. Did you go to the draft? No, we didn't. No, go. You didn't. No. Did people go at that point, or you just it was too? No far? idea. Yeah, I was just that was more a curiosity. No, we didn't. It was in Montreal where it always was, but we didn't go at all. No. Okay, and you just got the call that night. Yeah. You were up prepared for it. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I wanted to remind you. You said you had a great Harry Sinden plane story. Well, it was uh, it was how Harry was how, how Harry always was uh, thinking. So. We we were talking about chartered flights. You had to ask if we had any chartered yep. flights out west, and we didn't. Um, I think Detroit was the first team to have a plane. Uh, I, I think that they used it. But before that, uh, we um, we the Bruins were actually the first team to charter. Uh, so U.S. Air was a hub in Boston, and, and at night they would fly a couple of flights from Pittsburgh into Boston, and they would be deadhead flights where they would just actually take off in the morning. So they just needed the planes there. And Harry got, we would play there one night and Harry got the idea. They said, listen, if you're flying these planes, can we jump on? And they're like, yeah, sure. So we had no stewardess, no food, no nothing. We just got a free ride home. And so then I think the FA got in charge, you know, wind of it. And then they're like, well, you have to have stewardess now. And then it started up there. But Harry was actually the first one to do that, to save some money. We flew yeah. the deadhead plane back. That was the mandate back then with them, with the Bruins. <laughs> yeah. Save some money. Yeah. Oh, I know. Yeah. But it was pretty genius of him. He was the one that started the whole thing. Oh, for sure. I've heard him called a lot of things, but the one <laughs> overlap is genius. He was a super sharp guy. There sure was, absolutely. Um. The Devils team that you played for that won the Cup, you guys were the first team to get your day with the Cup, right? As, second. I think the Rangers. Oh, you second? Okay. Yeah. And I've I've seen some stories that you had a big bash uh, with the on your day up in uh, up in New Hampshire. Uh, yeah. Any oh, good stories okay. out of that? Or? No, we did. We were very quiet. Uh, <laughs> again, I was older and uh, – no, we just kind of sat around the house with it. We had a few people come over. Um, wind got out. We got out wind in through the wind, and there were a lot of people. But uh, it was uh, it was good. It was very low key. We didn't do we didn't do anything really special with it. I saw the picture uh, when I was looking up some stuff on your daughter of the picture of her sleeping with Stanley yeah. Cup, and then the sleeping with the uh, the other the trophy she won over in the um, over in the KHL there. Yeah, uh, it was great. That was great. Were, yeah, they were. She was. She was really young. I mean, I think if ninety five. Uh, um, well, that was two thousand ninety five. I think she was a year old, just a year and a bit. Yeah, that was when you were coaching. I think right when she was a little bit older. Yeah, yeah that was two thousand. Yeah, yeah. So she was about six. Well, it's a good segue. I saw she hat trick yesterday, right? This morning, as a oh, matter of morning. fact, oh, yeah, it was it was at five this morning. Yeah, the, um, they kind of they kind of clinched everything with that game today. I think she clinched the scoring. Um, she clinched most goals. They clinched best defense. They got the best goalie. They got first place. Uh, it was a big big game for them. So they have one more, and then the playoffs start. Yeah, they're pretty they're pretty stacked from what I was looking at. They have a pretty good record, like twenty three and two or something like that. They do. I I think they. Oh, I think they were two and two. I think they've they've won like twenty in a row, eighteen in a row. I think. Yeah, they won a roll. So now, uh, in doing my research about your kids, it um, it said that uh, she in a uh, uh, interview with Alex, she said that um, as much as you had the you know you set up rinks and everything for them when they were kids, she credits uh, her mom as a figure skater for <laughs> uh, for the skating stride. Yeah, her mom was an athlete, uh, and uh, she um, she was a figure skater for sure. So when we had the backyard rink, she would go out and work with them all the time. Um, okay, and your yeah. son too, I'm assuming. Oh yeah, yeah. All, yeah, all three of them. Yeah, they they can skate pretty good. So now she's over there in uh, China still. Uh, she's still doing well, and your son is playing down in um, Bridgeport for the uh, the Islanders AHL affiliate. Right. 
Right. Dallas's team is actually in Moscow this year. They didn't. Want oh, to right, right. Because of the because of the shutdowns. Yeah, yeah. yeah. which yeah. is great for them. It's a lot less travel, uh, for sure. So um, they actually are enjoying that. <laughs> Yeah, and you were telling me when we, before we were doing this how your son's playing, and even you still can't get in to go. No, no, we can't. It's uh, it's all locked. I mean, they're playing right down the street in Marlboro too, which yeah. is it's just too bad. But we get everyone on the AHL TV. Okay. Uh, we get some plugs, uh, US uh, HDMI that goes to a, either a Thunderbolt or a Lightning, and we can plug it right into the big TV. So we get uh, we get to watch every. And then his are great because every game's on at one, which I, which I like. I don't have to stay up late. It's yeah. Cool. <laughs> so now, do you talk to them after games with tips, pointers, or do they get the eye roll like that? I'm good. No, no, they always talk. Uh, Alex is t- is kind of tough because by the time hers gets over, we get we're, we're doing stuff. Uh, I think Bobo calls; he calls all the time. Um, but you know, they understand. They they know how they did. They know whether they played well or they struggled or things went good or things went bad. So we just generally talk about it, not not seriously. Sometimes uh, he doesn't call at all. Oh, okay. I just didn't know. I figured, like, hey, you got a dad who was in the NHL, good source, but then again, still your dad. So, well, yeah, you got to be careful that you don't overdo it. Um, and again, it's the balance between a player and a, and a, and a son. Uh, you know, you you sometimes you're you're a little bit more firmer on your kids uh, in some ways, and then sometimes you're a little bit more lax on them because of the they are your child. So it's it's a tough balance. You just got to stop to think before you do anything you don't want anything let anything slide but then you don't want to give them anything so it's um you just got to stop to think before you do anything and i guess the, the biggest thing is that you can overdo it uh you, right, can, right. you can tell them every single thing that they do wrong and that's not good either so it took a lot of practice at the beginning to, to get the right balance and uh and your youngest son brendan uh, inside linebacker at endicott i saw a comment from uh I'm not sure if it was your daughter or your other son saying that he might have been the best athlete growing up. Uh-huh. He, yeah, he was, he, he could, he could, yeah, he could play baseball. He played football. He could, he could skate very well. He just didn't like the hockey. Um, he's a bright kid. Uh, he's guys right now, currently now he's, um, since there wasn't much, um, action in the job front after he graduated last year, he didn't really feel comfortable taking any jobs because nobody was firm on salaries and stuff. So he right. did a, He's currently doing a nine-month uh, escalated math, MBA, so he'll have oh, wow. his master's in nine months. So, um, good for him. Good. Yeah, it is. Yeah, no slouch on the books then, for sure. No, no, no. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. Uh, yeah, I mean, and then I just want to talk a little bit. Um, I know that you were working uh, for Toronto, right, in player development, yeah. and I wanted to ask one thing I've seen, like I know a lot of players that have the ability, sometimes it's hard to translate it to coaching or to like scouting. Like the the people would talk, I've heard other interviews with like, they talk about Wayne Gretzky and he was a coach and they'd be like, well, do this and do that. And people, the co- players would be like, I'm not you, I can't do that. So is it, do you have to adjust like when you're looking at players through development to be like, oh, this kid's not going to make it or this kid is going to make it based on your own experiences? Well, the one thing a uh, player developer, the, the most dangerous thing that he could do is to, to make a prediction on whether the kid is going to make it or not. You do your job until that GM either doesn't sign him or he trades him. Um, okay. So you if, you if you have a preconceived notion that the player is, is, is here and the, and the team has a, a vision of them here, it doesn't work. Uh, you just have to continue to do your job. And you expect everybody to make it. I think the hot, one of the hard parts about the job is that the good players you don't really have. They, they're already play. You know, the first round pick, like the first we had uh, Morgan Riley. Good. I, mean, I think I worked with him two days and then he was gone. Uh, right. So, and then there's other guys that are there for six or seven years and they keep wondering, like, am I going to make it? Am I going to make it? And that's the hard part because it's not your decision to tell them yes or no. It's just. You got and you can only say, "Yeah, keep working." So many times. That's a difficult part when they get to be older and they haven't quite made it yet. Um, you know, but the younger kids, you know, the 18, 19, 20 year olds, the twenty ones, they're all excited and uh, they listen. They love the stories, um, and it's mostly just 
being a mentor, so to speak. I mean, we technically, especially if we have a junior kid or a college kid, we don't go tell them how to play. Uh, We don't tell them that you have to forecheck this way or penalty kill this way because then you interfere with what the coach wants to do. Our job is was just as a play developer was just to mentor them, make sure they're positive, make sure everything's okay, make sure they're eating well, make sure they're going to school or vice versa. So you're not teaching at all. Uh, You're just mentoring. Okay. Uh, and then I wanted to ask you, and I don't know how else to ask this. What possessed oh. you to decide to run the marathon? <laughs> oh well, you know it was interesting. It was um, it was yeah, it was a, that's an interesting story. So I didn't work the year before. Uh, we all got let go from trial. That was when they had the twenty people. So, but it was good because I was I, I wanted to stay home and see the kids play some more. And nothing really worked out for the next year. So it started to be like August or September, and the winter was coming. Everybody was kind of gone. Uh, the kids are all in college, so I, I really didn't know what to do. Um, I wanted to make sure I saw them. I didn't want to jump to a job where I was gone. Uh, forget I think Bo was just starting college, maybe or his sophomore year or something. So anyway, I like I didn't want to uh, I didn't want to get heavy and you know, winters were tough around here. So it was in the spring, as a matter of fact. So uh, when my the football players for Austin Prep, they all went to the track team after. So Brendan was a um, he was a thrower. So he did the discus and he did the shot put. So we had one meet somewhere I forget, and I had grown up with um, I don't know if. You guys would remember him at all, but he was a very, very famous runner from Peabody. He actually went to BC, qualified for the Olympics. He was a marathon runner. Um, so I went to junior high with him, and then I actually had saw him at one of Brendan's track meets, and I'm like, you know, we caught up for a while. I haven't seen him in a long time. So when September come around, nothing worked out. I'm like, you know something? I'm going to ask him a question. So we had coffee one morning, and I asked him if I if I could do it, and I, I didn't just want to do it in six hours. I said, I, you know, I want to do it. And he said, well, if I give you a program, we'll do something every day. Uh, it's going to take X amount of weeks. Uh, he said, you'll have no trouble doing it. So uh, he had a strict program that I, I did every single day. Um, I think we had one day off a week, depending on weather or depending on whether I was traveling with, to see Bobo play or whatever. And Was it was uh, it running, training, stretching, the whole gamut? Or? Everything. Yeah, it was all a lot of core work. Uh, and it was, again, like Tuesdays were the long days where you started out at six miles. Then, you know, you know, four, like, well, six months later, you ended up uh, – getting to your 20s, 21s, 22s. So the process took a long time. So it wasn't like you ever went out and ran 20 the first two weeks. It, it, right. it took a long time to build up. Um, you didn't really notice the change until the end. But I think I think through the whole process, I think I, I, that one year, I think I ran over like 750 miles. Jeez Louise. And it, and it was easy because yeah. you, were, you were prepared. And then, all right, so you did the marathon, completed, and then uh, Denna Lang, you knew her dad? Is that right? Yeah, I played with her dad when I was a kid. We played against each other, for with each other. Um, for, I mean, we used to travel together in the same car. So I think we were, oh, geez, 10, 11 years old. I think he's big over here by me uh, at Valley Sports. I think sure he is. Absolutely. Over here. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. A tremendous coach. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I've, yeah. I've heard nothing, but I'm, I can't wait for my daughter. Hopefully, if he's still there. <laughs> right. Uh, so you knew her dad. You knew her story. How you know the with when she got it at the um the game at Gillette, the outdoor game right. where she got paralyzed. Um, how did that come to be? Well, again, nothing happened for the next year. I, I wanted to stay close to home. Uh, again, they were both in college. And I kind of I enjoyed that uh, the marathon. I, I really wanted to do it again, but I just I didn't really want to do it for myself and try and beat my time. I think I did it in four. Uh, I did it in three. Sorry, I wanted to break four, so I did it like in three thirty-eight or something. And I'm like, okay, it was a weird number. Uh, I'm not breaking three to get to something. And I mean, like, what's the purpose of doing it again? For myself, I, I accomplished right. what I wanted you to do. Right. Yeah. So we talked to Susan Hurley, who runs all the charities for it. I talked to her about different ways we could run it. And we were going to 
I think we started out trying to go, uh, we were going to pair up with a blind person. And uh, we tried other people. We were just were throwing around ideas. And then um, Susan Hurley was the one that asked me about her because one of her charities was the journey forward that she was at. Okay. So Susan ended up um, talking to the mom. And we weren't able, we didn't really know if she could do it because uh, it was recent that it happened. We didn't know if she could sit in the chair for you know, six hours or five hours. Right. So, uh, come to find out she could. And, um, so we decided to run for journey forward, which I think she's like, I, I think we were close to a hundred thousand dollars. Yeah. I think you got just under from what I recall. She was saying, I read an interview with Dana and, uh, she was saying how they was concerned about her being able to regulate her body temperature. Exactly. Like, yeah. Day. And then, it, then there was the concern that she couldn't, communicate with you during the race because she right. couldn't turn but then she talked about the support from the crowd and it was like you weren't even there she was just enjoying herself yeah it's, it's it was a great story it was a great story and a nice thing to do for sure and the money raise was tremendous you know you can do a lot of good with that yeah it was great she was great i was i think we stopped once for Oh, maybe 15 seconds. Uh, she had to get pulled back up, or I forget what the reason was, but that was it. Um, that went that went pretty smooth, too. I think we did that like 4.15, uh, yeah. which, was, which was a real surprise. Flying, yeah. People were awesome, though. They were great. Do you still run? So, haha. <laughs> so then I took a year off after that. I... Um, Oh, I had shoulder surgery, so I couldn't I couldn't run, I couldn't train. Uh, so I had the rehab over the whole summer, and then so the next year after that, my the one youngest son, Brennan, the one that uh, the the student, he said that uh, he wanted to do it. So Freddie Braz had trained him when he was at Endicott, and I ran and trained myself. Well, actually, Freddie also did it, and so we both did it together. Uh, and then uh, that was the last time I ran, and I kind of. It, it wasn't as much fun anymore. Um, it kind of hurt. You were getting older. It was a lot of pounds. Yeah. So I got into the uh, the cycling. Uh, there's a lot of Bruins to the foundation. They they do the road bikes. So yeah. last summer, um, I didn't really enjoy running at the beginning of the year. Through this pandemic, it was nice to get outside. So they were all biking. So I grabbed one of the bikes and. Uh, one of my friend Matty Madden's had his son, and uh, I got addicted to the the cycling. I, I could we used to bike as kids everywhere all the time, but I yeah. forgot how, I forgot how good it was and how much I enjoyed it. So, I think I started last year and probably middle of June, and by some September, I think I did over twenty two hundred miles. Jeez. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. We had a lot of fun with that. So I'm a cyclist now. <laughs> no, no issue with the knee through the through the marathon. The big difference is like you'd run 10 miles and, and everything would hurt a little bit. Your back, you'd be sore, you had quads, this. Cycling, we go 30, 40, 50 miles, you get off and you don't feel anything. It's, you feel great. Uh, oh. It's very, very low impact on your body, but you yeah. get in great shape. Oh, for sure. Yeah. And it's a lot of the same muscles from hockey too, the legs. It is. It yeah. is. Yeah. We really enjoy, I really enjoyed the cycling. Oh, that's good. Uh, the one thing I did want to ask, and this is, I'll let you go. I know I've taken up a lot of your time. Uh, so you played with Brodeur in New Jersey, obviously. Yeah. And I wanted to ask, though, you played with arguably one of the best tandems in the history of the NHL here with Morgan Lemlin. Yes. I mean, they seem, I mean, this is from the outside, obviously. They seem like very different personalities, totally different cats altogether. Uh, you got any like insight to those guys or well i think that you just three you got three totally different goalies and, and actually almost two from two generations i mean reggie uh, was a holder uh reggie was a stand-up uh he cool. used his angles he didn't go down at all um uh moga was a smaller goalie that was very athletic and um and then you know I mean, you almost have like three separate generations to be honest with you um M Mogo was a very athletic goalie, even though he was short. Uh, he did very, very successful for a short goalie back then. And then, I mean, Marty was Marty. I mean, he just, it was amazing what he could do and uh, how he could see it. We became really close with Marty because all our kids are the same age. Uh, oh. The twins are Bobo's age. Uh, Anthony is uh, Alex's age. Uh, so it, we uh, we spent a lot of time together. We would go to Florida together. Um 
I think one time we went to Florida, we had, I think we had five kids under six years old and went to oh. Disney World. Yeah, it wasn't smart. <laughs> <laughs> My daughter asks all the time, I'm like, oh, maybe when you're like seven or so. That was tough. Oh, older. Yeah, that was tough. Yeah. Well, I mean, I could I could ask you questions about Bruins players for hours, but I know you got you know other things to do with your day. But I appreciate yeah. I appreciate your. Oh, this is fun. Time. It's been great, and it was great getting to know you a little bit. And uh, you know, thanks to the morning skate for letting oh, us. That was awesome. Out. Appreciate it anytime. And uh, yeah, all right. Well, this is Bernie signing off, and we'll see you soon. Thank you. Take care. Thanks, Bobby. Okay, bye bye.